I remember when we were touring the show uh, from MoMA out to San Francisco, there was concern about whether there would be any audience. And I said to people, having observed it at the Modern, well, I wouldn't be too worried. Um, no, you will not get huge crowds, but you will get unpredictable crowds. And you will see quickly what those crowds are made of, because when people walk past the door, if it's for them, they go in. They can't resist it a little bit the way it was for me when I first saw it at the Guggenheim. And if it's not for them, it's not for them. You know, don't worry. <laughs> it, it, it doesn't have to be for them. Um, it, maybe they'll get around to it, and that would be great. And that's why museums serve a function, because they actually reintroduce over and over and over uh, artists that the public might conceivably engage with. But it doesn't matter. The point is, if it engages them, they won't leave these galleries for a long time. And that was true in San Francisco, it's true in the modern, it's true here, I'm sure, too. Once people get into a room full of Ryman's paintings, not only are they stunned by them, but they also, they can't leave them. Our first speaker is Robert Storr, a noted teacher, curator, critic, and artist. Rob was curator and then senior curator in the Department of Painting and Sculpture in the Museum of Modern Art from 1990 to 2002. There, he organized the last major museum exhibition of Ryman's paintings, which was held in 1993. In 2007, he was the first American artistic director of the Venice Biennale, and currently he is the dean of the Yale School of Art. So, just find my notes. Yeah. Um, I'll just pick up from Jessica's remark, which is... Uh, Looking at uh, Ryman over time is what I have done a very great deal of, uh, and I will tell a little bit of what that means in a minute. Um, but I'm going to do this talk extemporaneously with a few notes uh, to remind myself of where I wanted to go when I get off on some detour. Um, I'm going to use as a title the title of a book of criticism by William Carlos Williams called In the American Grain, which is not to stress Ryman's Americanness all that much. Um, because, in fact, he is one of the American artists who is most respected outside of this country and, in some cases, was more highly regarded and paid closer attention to by people outside of this country than he was within this country. However, there, there, is, there is an element of his work which uh, follows in line with that idea, uh, and that element has to do with its objectivity and its relation to objectivity and to materialism altogether. Um, now, I would just say uh, on that score, right behind me on the screen, I asked the uh, tech person to please leave blank on there. Um, I'm going to do this without any slides. I'm going to employ ekphrasis, which is to say I'm going to describe things when I need to rather than showing them to you. Uh, and I would also add that when we were preparing the show uh, for the modern and also for the tape, um, Bob and I worked uh, really not with pictures at all. We worked with little thumbnail sketches that I'd made of all the paintings that I thought should be in the show. Um, and uh, at one point we sort of thought maybe we should make an index in the back of the catalog of these little thumbnail sketches because, in fact, uh, reproductions of Bob's paintings more than any other artist I know, and it's true basically of all artists, uh, betray those paintings. Um, there was a poor uh, victim of all of this who was responsible for color separations for a catalog that was done in Europe prior to ours who was hospitalized um, as a result of the stress of having to uh, work out color separations over four sheets so that you calibrated things that came out more or less acceptable on all sheets. Uh, and of course, when you deal with Bob's work, you deal with the background white, which on a page is never white, right? It's actually a dot matrix, and it's got the full spectrum in it, and it blushes this or it blushes that. So basically, uh, Bob's work is the single best argument for why it is that reproductions fail, for why it is that all the ideas about completely replacing, uh, you know, painting with pictures or pictures of paintings uh, falls flat. Um, Bob's painting is the most complete painting of any painter I know. I know others that are as, you know, complete, but none that are more so. Um, and those that are as complete are complete in ways that Bob is complete, but by different means and through different paths and for different reasons too. Uh, in any case, uh, it seems silly to show a picture of a picture which is, by definition, uh, something that cannot be pictured. Uh, what is in Robert Ryman's work is a physical address to a physical material at a certain proportion in a certain space, and each one is unique and each one is different, even when they belong to series where they are relatively related and relatively similar. Uh, and therefore, how can one do any service at all to generalize about such things? 
one can think about them in general terms, one can think about them in the categories that they, uh, you know, sort of uh, bring to mind in terms of the history of art and so on, but ultimately the particular is what matters in Ryman's work, which is why I thought we should replace this with Anselm, um, um, Giovanni Anselmo's uh, projection piece, Particulari, Particulari, which is a little word that appears on walls wherever he puts a projector. So next time I do this talk, maybe we can get the uh, Anselmo uh, and, uh, piece up here to look at instead of blank, because that's the other thing that this is on the wall for. Uh, there have been untold stupid headlines, stupid plays, uh, stupid commentaries about how Ryman's work is blank, uh, how it is a tabula rasa, it is the reductio ad absurdum, it is nothing. And of course, anybody who enters a room of Ryman's paintings knows all the ways in which that is not true the minute they walk in. So even if they come in their head with this idea that what this artist has done is to clear out everything and leave nothing, uh, they immediately find that nothing is highly variegated, richly uh, touched, thought, uh, calibrated, and so on and so forth, and that nothing looks pretty damn interesting, frankly. Um, and so that, uh, that that idea is, is, is one of the things one battles with. It's the, it's the, it's the, it's the, it's the elephant in the room much of the time. Uh, and so to have the word appear here to remind us that it is a nonsensical charge against his paintings is also helpful. Does somebody have a glass of water? That'd be great, or just a, whatever it is. Now, as I said, I'm gonna sort of do this a little bit in terms of the history of my relation with Ryman's work, more so than my history of relation with Ryman, which goes for a long period of time, but my relation with Bob's work started much before I ever knew him or I even knew that one could know him. Um, in the 1960s, um, I was a young man, uh, and I was a young man with passions about art. Most of them were connected to figuration, and in some cases to dramatic figuration. Um, I was completely absorbed by Picasso, and by the Picasso myth, and by the Picasso of, which I knew very well, which, becoming from Chicago, uh, we had excellent examples of. Um, I was also interested in Picasso in his relation to politics. Thanks. And I recall vividly coming to New York in 1967 and seeing Guernica in place along with all the studies that were there. And that was kind of my frame of reference. I, I, I was into Matisse and other people in the School of Paris, but Picasso was the person um, I did, as young men do, uh, made a pilgrimage. I went to La Californie in the south of France after having hitchhiked down there, hoping that I could see the master. Of course, I didn't. Um, I recall actually the stories that Ellsworth Kelly used to tell about how once Picasso almost ran him over on the roads in Paris and uh, pulled the car over, having nearly done so, opened the door and apologized and then invited him into the car and Ellsworth was so starstruck that he said no thank you and then regretted it ever since. <laughs> anyway, so I, I missed my chance to take a ride with Picasso, but I, I was a fellow traveler for a long time. Um, I also, in 1971, went to Mexico to work for Siqueiros because I was a believer that art should uh, be engaged in politics actively. Uh, my sense of politics then was different than it is now, but in any case, I was, in that case, involved in heroic figuration again, but grandiose and rhetorical, etc., etc., etc. Now, why do I say these things? Because uh, at the end of my college education, I came to New York in 1972 to make the rounds of galleries. I started to do that pretty much in 1968. And for four years, we'd go back and forth between Philadelphia, where I was in school, and New York, where I had friends and so on, and see shows. And I walked into the Ryman retrospective at the Guggenheim in 1972. I had never heard of this artist. Um, I was not thinking along lines that had anything to do with him whatsoever, or uh, the aesthetic that he was involved with whatsoever, and I was knocked out. Uh, and it was the first time I'd ever experienced a kind of art for which I had no words, no precedence, and no need, actually, to explain myself. Um, nobody was asking me what did it mean, nobody asked me did I like it, uh, nobody asked me anything about anything, it's just that there it was and there I was and it made a profound impression on me. Such that when I got to the modern many years later, it was the show I wanted to do most of all. Now, um, I had had in-between experiences. Uh, I was very close to uh, two women who ran the video data bank and I worked for them, uh, Lynn Blumenthal and Kate Horsfield. And they used to rent Lucy Lepard's loft when they came to New York. Uh, and for a year that Lucy was out of town, they had it for the entire year. So when I came to work with them, which consisted mostly of making the rounds of studios, collecting slides, uh, dealing with the artists that they had recorded already, and setting up appointments to make other recordings, um, I would stay in Lucy's loft as well. 
And I recall two things from that experience. One was a tiny little painting of Bob's that used to hang on the bookshelf by the front window. And the other thing was the Saul LeWitt uh, drawing on the wall, which uh, Lynn and Kate almost painted over because they didn't really see what it was and they just thought it looked kind of musty. Um, but fortunately, they did not. In any case, here again, without any preparation, I was with works of art deemed minimal or reductive or whatever it was, and never thought about whether they were reductive or not, just was really, really engaged in what they are on their own terms. Now, there's a concept that Bob talks about a good deal, and other artists of his generation talk about a good deal, which is not, I think, discussed nearly enough now, and that is the idea of making visible. When he talks about what he does, he talks about making certain things visible by doing what he does. And what things are they? Well, for starters, they're the things within the frame of the picture. Um, and the picture is not a picture within the frame of the work because it's not necessarily a painting. It can be a stretched piece of fabric with lines drawn on it. It can be a piece of paper with lines drawn on it. It can be a surface covered with pigment with no lines. It can be many, many, many things. But in any case, his task is to make something visible. And to do that does something else. The minute you make a thing visible in its own self-contained terms, uh, if you do it rigorously enough and if you do it uh, uh, decisively enough, you make everything around it visible too. Uh, we've all had the experience of walking out of a movie and being so alive to the colors and to the motion of the film that suddenly our humdrum world looks utterly different to us whether or not it has anything to do with the content of the movie. Uh, and good paintings do that. Good art in general does it, but paintings in particular do it. And they do it because they are physical in certain ways that stress the physicality of other things. Um, Daniel Buren used to do this. He used to talk about making things visible uh, by use of his uh, patterned, uh, uh, ready-made uh, stripes, because if you put them in the world as a marker, everything else around it was marked. And that became, therefore, an active experience, whereas previously, that is to say, before he intervened, it would be probably a passing experience. You would check off the things that you saw that you'd seen before. You would check off the new things and register the possible dangers in them and so on and so forth. But basically, the, the idea that what an artist does is to mark the world so that you can see it again, in addition to making a mark that is intrinsically interesting to look at, is, I think, sort of the defining principle of Bob's work and of a great many artists of that generation. Now, uh, he said in one place, and I was, I was actually going back through my book and I couldn't find the quotes. I'm also at this point where I've, I've been working flat out for 20 odd years, 30 odd years, and my memory's beginning to fail me. Um, it's just tired. <laughs> so now I have the liberty of forgetting things and misremembering them and making them up. And I will arrogate to myself all the privileges of the postmodern literary world to justify my misremembering. Um, but in any case, um, the phrase that I'm trying to find, or tried to find but failed, is something like this. It's a never a question of what to paint, but only a question of how. The how is the image. And that, again, is a, a defining aspect of his work, but it also, I think, nicely moves things out of where they were in the conversation before he began to make his work. Because on the face of it, that's a formalist statement. Uh, but formalism, generally speaking, was about templates, was about frameworks, was about the way in which you conceive of the picture, or object, or painting, or what have you. Uh, it was about the form as a, an idea to be made, but not necessarily where the making of it mattered all that much. And in the case of Bob's work, the making of it matters entirely. It is the whole damn show. Uh, and he doesn't know when he begins something how it's going to look when it comes out. In that sense, he's a kind of interesting uh, descant to uh, the, the ideas that uh, Saul LeWitt related to, although he and Saul were good friends and they respected each other enormously. But if Saul said that the idea is a machine for making art, Bob basically associated, at least I think, basically associated the materials at hand as being a predicate, a verb, set of verbs for the making of art. And exactly how it came to be and where it stopped was something that you worked your way into. It was intuitive. But again, back to the idea of in the American grain, it was objective. There was never a question of turning those materials to a purpose outside of what they had themselves represented or were. It was not a matter of making the materials speak to transcendental things, ethereal things, unnameable things. It was a matter of making them speak very clearly in their own idiom. 
and of organizing the bits and pieces of these different materials within these different formats at these different scales in such a way that the materials conspired to make something that had never existed before. Now, I refer this a little bit uh, to, the, uh, to this in the catalog, but there used to be, and I hope it still is, a marvelous wall of 8x10 glossies made by Eva Inquiry and God only knows who else, uh, of the things that Bob made that he put on his wall after he had made them and after they'd gone out into the world to be shown. And it's a, it's a kind of wonderful uh, timeline, mosaic line of all of these compositions. And I've always imagined, again, it's hypothetical, that in looking at these, Bob was sort of, Pascal talked about the two infinities, the infinity of addition and the infinity of division. And that in looking at these walls over and over and over, he would imagine what you could add to it at any point, or what you could open up as a parenthesis and add to by subdivision. So that the, the whole matrix becomes a, uh, a template for thinking about something that doesn't exist, but for choosing the materials that it would allow it to exist. And then in so doing, you would have all of these things in your mind as you were doing something that was right there in front of you. Now, this way of working is pretty much against the grain of most of formalist painting in that period. And it was also pretty much against the grain of the logic of most of formalist art at that time because he was not interested in extending the history of art by deducing or analyzing what it had been and what was missing from it. He was interested in extending the logic of his own working habits by doing something. And to take your own materials, your own circumstances, your own field of action as the primary thing rather than to try and outsmart the history of art, which is what almost I don't know, the majority of uh, formalist painters were trying to do in the 1960s was a huge uh, shift in emphasis and redirection of attention, which is not to say that he did not contribute to the history of formalist painting, it's just that that wasn't his goal. Being empirical in the way that Bob is and being pragmatic in the way that Bob is, again, I think is a very American turn of mind. To not analyze, theorize, invent, speculate about what needs to be done for some kind of reasons that are beyond what's in one's immediate tactile range, uh, but rather to do it in terms of, oh, this, and then this, and then this, and if you put them together, what do you have? And if you think about how Bob began to work, I mean, he was a guard at the Museum of Modern Art, he was a serious jazz student, he wanted to make music, he did not want to make paintings, and he started doing little exercises on uh, exhibition cards that came to him and others at the Modern. And when we were doing the show, we found a few of them where you could see what was on the exhibition card on the opposite side, and sometimes if you really try, you might see something underneath the paint. But to consider that he was basically noodling, you know, with available cheap materials, and that for a long time, he didn't really have art supplies as such. There was a store on the way from the Modern to where he had an apartment, and he would pick up materials, but he wasn't really shopping to make his art in the way that later on he became one of the great shoppers. He was looking at materials that nobody had ever made out of before, ever, and as well as becoming a master of the traditional media of oil paint, wash, uh, and casein, and all of those things that he used. In any case, the idea that you would just sort of make it up as you go along and have the courage to make it up as you go along, I think in some ways also uh, have the lack of ambition that people who are truly ambitious have, which is to say he was not competing with the other guys, he was trying to satisfy his own desire to do something. And he had an infinitely expandable desire when it turned out that he did in fact have a sort of a grip on something. But he was not trying to best his betters, his betters, uh, his peers, his whatever, he was trying to make the thing he needed to make. Now, some other thoughts. Um, let me make sure that I'm doing it on time. Um, Bob's work is beautiful. That's an adjective. Um, we've had a decade and a half of the beauty discourse, uh, where people try and talk about beauty as an absolute thing, as, a, uh, as, a, as an antidote to ugliness. As an antidote, what they really mean usually is to ideas. Uh, the beauty brigade, as I'll call it, the beauty brigade is composed of people who are really miffed um, that art got weird on them. Um, and that art asked them to think hard about things, particularly think hard about things that they didn't want to think about at all, that they'd in fact gone into art to avoid thinking about. 
Um, now, uh, again, in this generation, in the generation of Bob and of Lucy and of many other people, the separations between art and the world didn't exist as they were then sort of reinforced in the 80s and 90s, and vice versa, that the uh, separations between common talk and exquisite uh, theoretical talk didn't exist in the same way either. Uh, the people of that generation were fairly activist. I am a younger part of that generation, but I know this firsthand. Were fairly activists. They were fairly hands-on. They saw the world in a terrible state, and Saul or anybody else could, on the one hand, make a rarefied aesthetic object, and it was an aesthetic object. The anti-aesthetic is an invention of people who are uncomfortable with the aesthetic, not people who understand what it is. Um, the ant, you can make an aesthetic object and at the same time go to a demonstration or participate in group organizations to deal with the housing shortage or to deal with racial injustices and so on and so forth. This generation of people approached problems as they kind of were right in front of them. And of course, everybody makes mistakes, but they made fewer than we have done in recent years. And they have refused to accept dichotomous arrangements and to keep things at war with one another in order to reinforce what they were doing. I mean, to take this for example, two of the most generous eyes uh, towards the art of others were two of the most demanding and rigorous artists, that's Donald Judd and Solowit. Um, both of them collected broadly, both of them collected unpredictably, and both of them respected things that were totally at odds with what you would have presumed their ideas about art to be, given what they made. The enforcing of hard and fast separations between figuration and abstraction, between uh, all these different categories that people have invented, uh, that's something that came later. That came as an effort by critics to tidy up a world which was interestingly messy and which the artists themselves kept interestingly messy. And in the case of Judd, he was the most interestingly messy thinker with the most curt, direct, and uh, vernacular way of talking about these issues. Um, he was a theoretician. He had studied philosophy. He had studied with Meyer Shapiro. He was a learned man, but he didn't talk the jargon of contemporary art criticism, and he didn't need to, because he was able to address things for what they were in his own language, and he was willing to stand his ground, and if he didn't like it, fuck it. Yeah? Just to use some art critic language. Um, so, um, and of course, a little scotch never hurt. Um, <laughs> now, I... Bob's attitude was much less pugnacious. Um, but he himself was able to see and have an interest in things that people don't think he would have an interest in, uh, don't think he would even see. Uh, the fact that he you know, has work in his house uh, by Sylvia Mangold, by uh, uh, Jan Dibitz, by a host of other artists of his generation probably goes naturally with the fact that artists exchange work. But those works are not consistent with his work. They are different, and that is, I think, probably what he savors about them. And the idea of having a logical train of thought that you then impose on everybody and everything around you in order to maintain your position is alien to the way in which he does things, because what, the way he does things is to make the work that he felt necessary, and he therefore respects others who make work with equal conviction that is equally necessary in its own way. Now, back to beauty. One can say that Bob's work is beautiful, and I think it is very beautiful. Um, it elicits, not a stunned owl effect exactly, but when people see his exhibitions, they do gasp when they walk into a room. They do stop. I remember when we were touring the show uh, from MoMA out to San Francisco, there was concern about whether there would be any audience. And I said to people, having observed it at the Modern Well, I wouldn't be too worried. Um, no, you will not get huge crowds, but you will get unpredictable crowds. And you will see quickly what those crowds are made of, because when people walk past the door, if it's for them, they go in. They can't resist it a little bit the way it was for me when I first saw it at the Guggenheim. And if it's not for them, it's not for them. You know, don't worry. <laughs> it, it, it doesn't have to be for them. Um, maybe they'll get around to it, and that would be great, and that's why museums serve a function, because they actually reintroduce over and over and over. Uh, artists that the public might conceivably engage with. But it doesn't matter. The point is, if it engages them, they won't leave these galleries for a long time. And that was true in San Francisco, it's true in the modern, it's true here, I'm sure, too. Once people get into a room full of Ryman's paintings, not only are they stunned by them, but they also, they can't leave them. 
And the best way to show Ryman's work is, of course, with other Ryman's work. You can, you can stick him in a history of art lineup, and he'll always look good. But the best way uh, is to teach people how to understand these works by giving them the opportunity themselves to make the comparisons among them so that they can see how the quality of one is not repeated in the next, but actually something analogous occurs, but it occurs in a very different fashion, and it occurs in a way which is non-chronological. There's not development in Ryman's work. Uh, trying to write about his work in that way is a futile exercise. Of course, there's a sequence, but that's not the same thing as a development. Um, and to teach people that the way to understand works of art is to tell themselves what they're seeing in order to better see what they're seeing uh, is the thing that happens when people are cut loose in a room. And it is the way in which people learn from Ryman's work how to look at other work. Because he is the best education for the eye that I know of. And this is a sweeping generalization, but I will stand by it. And people who are able to look at his work comparatively and uh, engage with it without asking themselves the wrong questions, but allowing impressions and thoughts to well up as they are looking at just what is right there, are therefore empowered to do a lot of other things once they leave the gallery. And those questions that well up in them are, I think, relatively simple. Um, again, if you go into a Ryman exhibition and asking yourself, whither art, whither painting, uh, you are in trouble already. You know? Um, he, in an interview with me, as I recall, said something to the effect of, you know, after all, abstract art is only very young. Uh, if it starts roughly 1907, uh, you know, we're only into the 107th year of it. Uh, it's a new art form in Western culture. It's not, of course, new uh, in other cultures, but it's new in Western culture, in modern culture anyway. Uh, and therefore, why should we be so worried about its survival? Why should we think that everything is teleological in the sense that uh, we are going to run out of juice pretty soon? If one man can make this many paintings out of, relatively speaking, the same materials, it's proof of the opposite. It's proof that it is really infinitely rich in possibility. And of course, if another man or another woman, Agnes Barton, for example, makes a number of paintings out of roughly the same materials, and they're all different, that multiplies the ways in which difference is possible within apparent sameness. The sameness is a linguistic sameness. You say white, people go, I got it. You show them whites, and they realize they don't have it. Merrill uh, made a wonderful, Merrill Wagner, uh, Bob's wife, made a wonderful painting. Uh, she, she bought all of the Naples yellows that were available on the market, made by all the different people who make Naples yellow. And she made a, a, a series of paintings, and I remember one of them, which was, I saw, called horizontal in squares. And every one of them is totally different, right? So you take the linguistic homogenizer and you use the material reality to bust it up. And in the meantime, you've had this most beautiful spectrum of yellows, which will key your eye to seeing yellow everywhere and to seeing differences within differences and refinements within refinements. And let me add another anecdote. These are not the uh, things that make connoisseurs. This is not the sort of difference within difference, refinement within refinement, that is only available to people uh, who are educated, who are thoughtful in certain ways, who are trained in academies, who are trained in workshops. Um, this is an anecdote I've used over and over again, so I apologize if you've heard it, but I will tell you. Uh, years ago when I was broke, I took the video data bank takes of Lynn and Kate and taught a course at Rutgers. And I showed everything uh, under the sun. Uh, figurative painters, abstract painters, performance artists, conceptual artists, blah, blah, blah. Um, and there was one guy in the back of the class who had a surly look from the day one and clearly had taken this class as a gut and was very put out that it was not so easy. And that there was nothing in it that he could immediately relate to. And there was, as I recall, we showed Rackstraw Downs and Philip Perlstein, we showed Agnes Martin, and we saw Saul, Saul Lewis. I mean, there was a wide range of things. And none of it, you know, figurative, abstract, whatever, none of it got to him. And I took Ryman's tape and I put Ryman's tape up and suddenly he lit up. And of course, in those days when we showed the tapes, we showed the tapes with slides. And then slides lie for all the reasons I told you, but still, he was getting the imagery. And he was completely excited and came up to me afterwards and dropped his surly young man look and sort of asked about who this guy was. So at that point, I gave me an opportunity to ask him who he was. Uh, and it turns out that he had made his living as a house painter. And he could tell exactly the grades of paint that Bob was using, and the ways in which he was using them, and the surface on which he was using them. And he was grooving on it. 
you know? Now, if persons familiar with materials can see the poetry of what Bob's doing just because they know what those materials are capable of and how he has used them in extraordinary ways relative to that capacity, that means Bob's work is not inherently an elitist art at all. It is only limited by people who are able to take stock of the material reality and to understand how it is being used and to what purposes. So I'll speak a little bit on that. But for starters, then again, if you say that Bob's painters are, paintings are beautiful, it is not in the furtherance of the idea of beauty as the opposite of difficult, as the opposite of conceptual, as the opposite of political, as the opposite of all the things that the beauty brigade hates, right? It is fact, beauty is something manifest. Beautiful things exist, people make them. And there is a consistent enough response among people who are alert enough to what those things are that you really have a sense that this is exceptional and therefore it is worth more of your time rather than less. And therefore people who catch that, who walk past the gallery and go in and stay for a little longer than usual or maybe a very long time, are people who are, who are letting themselves experience beauty without having to think about it, which is the most beautiful way to experience beauty. We have privileged words to an extraordinary degree, and we have privileged arcane words to an extraordinary degree, and we have forgotten how to speak about exceptional things in the vernacular, in a spoken idiom, in a way in which people actually talk to each other and experience the world. And therefore, an artist like Ryman is in every way a provocation to speak plainly about plain things in order that you will understand how rare plain things really are, how rare beautiful plain things really are. And in terms of the logic of critique, uh, if I understand it correctly, the word critique means to shed light on things, right? Well, Bob's work sheds light on everything around it. It sheds light on itself. It sheds light on the false premises that are thrown at it or held against it. It sheds light on extraneous blah, 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 blah talk. It sheds light on everything under the sun and it also then reaffirms that there is something left over when you're done critiquing that can be affirmed, that is not just about taking something apart, but it's about saying something is there that is worth special attention, special respect, and that is actually fundamentally democratic. Beautiful things are critiques of ugly things, true, um, but they're also critiques of false ideas of beauty, and a really beautiful thing makes a lot of the uh, metaphysics of beauty dissolve as much as it makes a lot of other things that are of another nature dissolve. Um, objectivity is also a critique. It's a critique of its opposite, which is vagueness, um, abstraction of a different order, the abstraction you can never get to. Now, I'm not gonna get into an argument about platonic versus other kinds of modes, um, but I am an anti platonist let me put it simply, and I'll put my cards on the table. I don't believe that the world is elsewhere. I believe it's here and now. It's bad. It's also sometimes good. Um, but in any case, things that are objective are grounding in terms of thinking about the rest of the world. Uh, and things that are objective and beautiful are grounding in, things, in terms of thinking about other things in the world which are either beautiful or ugly or, in other ways, a challenge to us in our composition of that world. And Bob's work serves that function. It's a very simple function in a way. The, the task is very simple. Doing it is extraordinarily difficult. Um, and Bob would be the last person to say that that is what he is doing because he is not kind of a missionary of his art. He's not trying to make a big, big statement. He's just making one, that's all. Um, and at the same time, he is sufficiently aware of what the stakes are. So let me take another piece of the interview um, that I did with him, and, he, and, and uh, I asked him basically at the end of the interview, well, what's this all about? What's your, what's your, what are you doing? He says, he's doing it for the experience of, and there was a pause, enlightening. An experience of delight, well-being, and rightness. It's like listening to music, like giving, uh, going to an opera and coming out of it and feeling somehow fulfilled, that what you experienced was extraordinary. It sustained you for a while. You can't explain it to, any, so to someone who has not experienced it. Now, we're sitting in a room here where everybody's experienced Ryman's work. 
And we're going to hear today a lot of other explanations, and they will come from a variety of points of view. And as much as I've made a kind of polemic here, I am quite not averse to art history. I'm not against uh, abstract thought about the history of art. I welcome all of that kind of stuff. I just don't think it comes first, and I don't even think it comes last. I think first and last is experience, and in the middle, you ask all those questions because the reason for asking them is often that they don't necessarily shed more light on the art. What they do is they clear away the cobwebs of ideologies that have obscured that art. Among them, the idea of the last painting. It was a lovely gambit that Ad Reinhardt threw out there, uh, and then he proceeded to make, much like Bob, an awful lot of last paintings. Each one of them different. Um, there is, however, a concerted effort on the part of a critical community to declare the end of painting and with it the end of art. And along the way to the end of painting, certain artists are picked as being exemplars of that process of exhaustion. And some of them are the assassins of art. Richter was once given this uh, role. And the others are the saving last remnants of art. And Bob was given that role. Um, so that it was thought that what Richter was doing by a number of critics was taking all of the different conventions of art and doing them in a cynical, destructive way so as to show you that there was nothing to them anymore. There may have been once upon a time, but there wasn't anymore. So that if, for example, Richter painted a Titian painting of the Annunciation, the assumption was that he was showing you that this is now a category of art which is null and void forever. I'll get back to Richter in a second. Ryman was thought to be the person who would somehow slipped under the historical wire. He was still doing what was impossible to do, and because he was so good at it and such a good guy, he was allowed to do it until he ran out. But no one ever else would be able to pick that up again. That was done. End of, end of, end of story, end of uh, polemic, end of everything. Now, why should this be the case? What, what, what is it in the deterministic histories of art that says this should be the case? Why is it particularly when neither of the artists involved believe it's the case for them? So when Gerhardt makes a painting of the Annunciation after Titian and it disintegrates over the uh, series of five paintings, uh, he is not saying this is no longer possible categorically. It is saying it was not possible for me now. You paint the paintings you can paint when you can paint them and when you can't paint them anymore, you stop. And it's worth running the experience through to see if you can paint that painting. He sincerely wanted to paint a Titian, but couldn't. He severely wanted, uh, sincerely wanted to paint a Vermeer and could. And there are paintings of his that are equal to Vermeer. He only did one of them because he didn't need to do uh, several times. He was a critic of beauty in his own way. And he made a series of pictures of his wife and child, which he then scored and flayed. The reason being that they were too pretty and not truly beautiful. And he said something to the effect of how beauty needs to be wounded for it to be trustable. And so he wounded an image of his own family and child. Now, Gerhard is an interesting character because Bob and Gerhard knew about each other for a long time. This book from which these interviews come has its uh, Helmut Federley, Bryce Marden, uh, Bob Mangle, uh, Robert Ryman, and Gerhard Richter. And these was from the 1980s. Um, and it's interesting because uh, Bob was never very keen on Gerhard and uh, kind of thought he was, uh, you know, more Dada than not, and was not really a painter, but was kind of a, a trickster, gamester, and so on and so forth. Uh, and was mistrustful of what this artist was doing. But it's interesting what happens when people really meet each other, when they really uh, immerse each other, themselves in each other's work. Uh, it was the custom at the Modern to invite to dinner parties and openings all the artists who had recently had retrospectives. So that when Gerhard had his show, which I also did, um, I invited Bob to the show. I didn't know if he'd come or not because I knew that he had sort of mixed feelings. Um, but he did. And he came and he looked at the whole show from start to finish while everybody else was having cocktails and schmoozing. And he came into the dining room as we were all to sit down, he said, he's really a painter. And he is, of course. Um, but, you know, for him to have gone through that experience and come to that conclusion after having been that skeptical was a huge uh, move on his part. As I was organizing Garrett's show, 
Um, I was in Germany, and I noticed that in Bonn there was a retrospective of Bob's work. And I had no idea what Gerhard thought about him. I said, listen, could I uh, take half the day off and go over to Bonn and see this exhibition before I miss my opportunity? And uh, Gerhard said, no, 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 let's drive over there. Um, he, he loves Ryman's work, loved it. Uh, and so we jumped into his um, BMW, and he drove like a bat out of hell to, um, um, to uh, Bonn, and we went to see the show. And Gerhardt crawled the walls. He looked at every detail of every picture more carefully than you can imagine. There's this wonderful drawing that Gustin made of Tom Hess looking at art. And Tom Hess's eyes, I know it's Meyer Shapiro, I think. Meyer Shapiro's head is up against the painting. There's this huge eyeball, you know, so, like moving over the surface. Like it was kind of like trying to sort of decode the surface. Well, that was the way he looked at it. And he loved that work. Now, the dynamic is also interesting because, you know, Bob made paintings that were nominally all white. Um, Gerhardt made paintings that were gray. Gerhardt did not make paintings that were black. And if you do think in ideological or symbolic terms about black and white, the polarities were there. They were there with um, Reinhardt, certainly, with other artists. Um, and with Bob being the other side. And Gerhardt basically took the position that one could not affirm absolutes under any circumstances. That to do so was to make a statement about the world, not just to choose a color. And so he made paintings in gray. He made paintings that made you queasy and uncertain all the time, right? But he wished he could make a Ryman painting. And his, his, his gray paintings are to Ryman as his Titian is to Titian. It's a meditation on what was not possible for him that was possible for an artist he admired, but in this case, it's an artist of his own time and roughly his own age. Now that also is interesting because the discourse of painting in the 80s took account of none of this, or at least the mainstream discourse took account of none of this. First of all, painting was supposed to be dead, it just wouldn't lie down. Um, and secondly, if it wasn't dead, it should sort of be tending in that direction. And artists were measured in terms of their seriousness as to whether they were furthering this uh, you know, dying swan routine, or I don't know, Julius Caesar routine. Um, and in any case, uh, here are two artists who were just doing it. And there are, of course, many, many, many artists who were just doing it who couldn't get the time of day from anybody because they were told what they were doing was an anachronism. Now, I will sort of stop now because I think I've pretty much used my, my time. But I would just put it to you that I could have given you an art historical lecture. I could have done a lot of things with this time, but I decided I'm reached the age where I don't particularly care to do that. I'm tired of arguing with people who don't argue back. Um, I'm tired, tired of people who argue with people who don't look before they argue. Uh, so that you can't even point to evidence and say, well, what about that? Because there is no evidence if your artist, art, argument is meta something or other, right? In fact, the idea of evidence, the idea of facts is an offense to people who believe that it's all up on this abstract plane, right? It's all epistemic. It's not. It's down here. And Ryman's work is down here. Lots of it around us here. And even on this cover, it looks pretty good. I mean, this is about as good as a photograph gets, you know, because you can really see the texture, okay? That is what he has spent his entire life doing. And just the other day, I saw a video, which was beautiful, of Bob working on a picture with uh, Coltrane in the background, as engaged in the down here, here and now of painting as ever he was. And there are other artists out there who were involved in it. We just lost Ellsworth Kelly. Um, but, you know, 